And uh, Marissa Hall, she's our, our librarian. If you, we want to allow her to talk, let me push that button. Marissa, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, how you doing? Yes. Good. How are you? Thank you so much for doing this. Of course. Thank you for having us and, and for the flexibility of the last minute oh. change. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. I totally understand. Yeah, yeah. A lot of driving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, it's just been crazy. And uh, I just had another trip canceled too because of the hurricane. So oh, geez. sometimes, yeah. Oh. But here we are. That uh, if, if anything COVID gave us, it's a, a lot better Zoom skills. <laughs> That's very true. You're right. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, we'll probably wait, you know, several more minutes for people to come on in and I don't know Perfect. if you had any library announcements or anything that you wanted to. I'm work. pretty good. Um, next week, next Tuesday at seven, we're having a um, introductory to trade school program um, that will be here in the library with Brookdale Community College. So very cool, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Trade school also very good option. I mean, Ivy League's great. Trade school's great. Like it's all what fits you. Right. And that's that's kind of what we try to do here at Princeton College Consulting. It's how to find the best fit school for a particular student. But today we're hoping to give you some tips and tricks on if your heart is set on the more selective schools. So. Brian, nice to join us. Are you waving hello or you just uh, you have a question? I think you guys can pop into the chat as well if you have anything you'd like to say. Brian's just waving. We'll wave back. <laughs> so we've got a junior from India on the call, and they must be super serious about their applications because it's 4.30 a.m. there. Mm. Uh, Kim, Brian just messaged me. I the chat is disabled right now. I will work on that right this second. Sorry about that, Brian. Good, good. Good comms. <laughs> well, it's awesome. Thanks for, for calling in from India and taking time out of your super early morning, I assume it is. <laughs> yeah, 4.30 in the morning. Wow. Yeah. That's dedication to learning. Love it. All right, we have, we have the chat working yet? Yep. Perfect. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started and as people filter in, they'll join us where we're at. So nice to virtually sort of see everybody tonight. Awesome, chat's working, great. Thank you for joining us and, and thanks to the Middletown Public Library for sponsoring this. Um, we originally were planning on doing it in person, but life happened and here we are virtual, but hopefully everybody's sitting comfortable at home and can enjoy this presentation. Our goal today is to give you some insight into what the selective college admissions process looks like from the perspective of you know what the college admissions officers are really truly looking for in students. Because as you might suspect, it's not just about grades and test scores anymore. It's about more. It's about the character. It's about the full picture of the student and who they are, what their motivations are, and ultimately what they can contribute to the selective college community. So my name is Nikki Bruno, I will be your host tonight, and I'm a college admissions counselor at Princeton College Consulting based out of Princeton, New Jersey, but we work virtually. So we've got students all over the country, we've had international students as well, so definitely willing to be flexible, especially with those time zones, and we're here to be a resource for you. So if you have any questions about anything college related, um, I'll leave some time at the end to answer those as well. If you have any questions regarding specific slides I'm on, you know, we'll tackle them as they 
come and then at the end I'll open it up to just any questions in general. I know some people submitted some questions about essays and extracurriculars and other things that really aren't the main topic of this particular presentation, but I would definitely be glad to speak about that. So, but I would first like to ask all of you a question, a poll, if you will, and maybe you can answer in the chat just to gauge a sense of where we're thinking. What are some reasons you think a college will accept a student? So put what you think in the chat. Adding to their particular college. So like adding a particular kind of student, maybe you mean something positive to the community. Yeah, mm -hmm. somebody who will contribute to campus, probably somebody who is already contributing to their community. A college will think that, oh, they'll be a positive addition to the college community. Well-rounded, it shows commitment to that college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we call that uh, demonstrated interest in the field, and, and I'll touch on that a little bit tonight, I can. Um, yeah, because colleges, at the end of the day, they are businesses. They want to know for sure, you know, this student who is applying and wants to go that they're actually going to go, we can count on those tuition dollars, but also you can count on that student being a part of our community. So like all things in life, commitment is very important. Any other thoughts? Cool. Um, to the point of well-rounded, I, I actually want to say it's I want to say it's a complete myth. Um, obviously, well-rounded students are welcome, but I also think that we call them pointy students are also welcome at colleges too. Like not every student needs to be well-rounded, but a college wants as a whole as a well-rounded student body. So if you have a student who's super gung-ho, engineering, everything, math, robots, you know, building race cars, all that stuff, he doesn't need to join the marching band and take art classes and do musical theater in order to be more appealing to a college. It's totally fine that that student is super into engineering. So just want to knock out that myth. If you're feeling any pressure that you need to add a bit more roundedness to your resume, if it's not something that you truly want to do, if you don't want to do art and it doesn't really fit in with any of your career goals, you don't have to do it just to impress a college. Um, so, and that's also a little bit what we'll talk about today is the, the authenticity factor. So basically, as I mentioned previously, right, the college admissions process, it's, it's a character-based evaluation these days, right? You got your grades, your test scores, that's just kind of the bare minimum, especially when you're looking at more selective colleges. They do holistic admissions, as they call it now, and the word holistic means looking at the whole person. So it's not just what they're doing academically, but what they're doing outside of school and even outside of school, like clubs. What are you doing at home? What are you reading about in your spare time? What kind of podcast are you listening to? So I've been seeing lots of interesting essay questions this year, working with my seniors, um, some short answer questions. It's just like, what did you do last Thursday? Like that's an essay question or list the you know, 10 books that you read in the last year. So they're really trying to get a sense of these students' personalities. And back to some of what you guys said, how a student will overall fit into the larger community. So holistic admissions, again, looks at the whole person. And there's a, a benefit to that in that, you know, maybe you didn't get the most amazing SAT score in the world. Like it was pretty good, but when we're thinking about Ivy League schools, good a good score for an Ivy League is, you know, 1500s plus, if not 1520 or more. But let's say you have really rigorous classes and you're a super leader in your community and you've done a lot of really cool things and your tech, but your test scores aren't amazing. That's not going to hurt you totally, right? However, you do want to make sure you have a lot of strength all around. Now, if you completely bomb the test, that's test optional. That's a whole other question. Um, but let's say you have really good test scores, really good activities, but your grades are not very good, right? You, you do want to make sure that your weakest link is still somewhat strong. Um, so again, we're looking at the whole person. It's, it's competitive 
And the more we can boost you up in different areas can hopefully, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships, as the saying goes. You want to lift up the other areas of your profile. So this little pinwheel here is how we like to sort of display the whole picture and it all points back to character. And we don't have a ton of time in this presentation to go really in depth into each of these things, but I'll give just kind of a quick overview. Um, the first one you'll see on top is rigor of curriculum. And the more rigorous your curriculum, the more it shows a college that you can handle a really high level of academics, a really you know intense course load. And you can show rigor through taking AP courses or IB courses if your school offers IB, or even, even doing dual enrollment, taking college courses while you're still enrolled in high school. Um, honors classes as well. So my general rule of thumb when I'm advising students is take the hardest class you can possibly handle. And if you get a B plus, that's okay. If you're getting B pluses in all of your classes, maybe something's got to give, but it's really important that you're pushing yourself to your maximum achievement levels. GPA and class rank, that kind of speaks for itself. Um, a lot of schools are not doing class rank anymore, especially schools in New Jersey. I've noticed more of what they're doing is the guidance counselors, when they send out their information to colleges, they send out something called a school profile, which has a general overview of the student body. So they'll list maybe what the average GPA is, what the you know first quartile or the third quartile GPA is, so that a college admissions officer can see an individual student's GPA within the context of kind of the average of the school, but not necessarily doing a straight up rank. Um, a lot of high schools have decided that that's putting undue stress on students, but definitely a, a college will know where your GPA stands in rough relative context to others. So it's it's sort of there. Um, SAT, ACT, that's our standardized tests. Sometimes people will ask me, which is better? Whatever one you do better on, the practice test. Um, colleges have no preference between SAT or ACT. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard that the SAT is changing in the spring to a digital model. It's a little bit more adaptive. So maybe the SAT might be better for some students who are looking for a shorter testing experience. So that'll definitely be interesting to see once that comes out, how that's affecting the playing field. But general rule of thumb, just take one of them and you'll be fine. Subject tests and AP exams. Uh, SAT subject tests have pretty much been phased out at this point. I don't think there are uh, many students left that have taken them, maybe from a few years ago, but the, the SA College Board kind of dropped that and it's been replaced with AP exams. And there are only a few colleges that are really considering AP scores as part of the admissions, but the ones that do, again, they're looking to see how well did you do in that rigorous context. But AP scores are also good for other reasons, like once you're enrolled in college, it helps you to maybe get a higher placement level in like a math class, or maybe can help you get credit for like if you take AP Psych and do well on the test, you can get credit for that class. So, but they are college level classes overall. So even if let's say you're taking an AP course and you do really well, but your AP score isn't so good, you don't necessarily have to submit that in your application, um, depending on the school but there are there are a few that do want to see them so that's kind of where we talk about the numbers part of the profile right the, the data points the rest of it feeds in a lot more to what we call the character part so personal traits so your extracurricular resume right everything that you do outside of school extracurricular and extracurricular doesn't necessarily refer to as official school clubs and organizations. It could be an ind project, independent project that you do. Um, just for an example, I have a student I'm working with this year who is super into whale watching. Like his whole family's into it. He grew up in a whale family. There is no whale watching club at his school, but it's something he spent a lot of time on, is dedicated a lot of time to. He's part of a nonprofit that helps save the whales. So that totally counts as an extracurricular. Uh, application essays. So those, uh, there was a, a question I heard, um, I saw come in about essays and, and how to write a good essay. And that is a whole other presentation in and of itself. But the, the crux of these essays is it's really important, again, to show your personality, to show your character, to show your values, to show your ability to reflect on those values, your ability to show your growth over time. 
Um, some of the best essays I've seen are on really random topics. I've had kids write about their antique collections. Uh, I have one this year who wrote a, a really brilliant essay about um, love languages and how he expresses love in different ways to different people. And, you know, not what I would say stereotypical essays. Um, so sometimes students worry if their essay is, you know, an interesting and unique enough topic. And there's only so many topics that a 17 year old could probably write about, but re really makes an essay stand out is, again, how much they're digging into that reflection and showing that they're a deep thinker and showing that they can make various connections between maybe academics and maybe another area of their life or two different areas of their life. So the personal statement is really about that kind of story. The supplemental essays are usually much more straightforward. They're questions like, why do you want to go to the school? Why do you want to study this major? Um, you know, tell us about the community that you're from. So those essays are a little bit easier to do just because they're not as much of a lengthy growth story. But you still do have to show, right, how how you think and how you behave and how you reflect on um, different areas of your life. And I'd say the essay is probably the most important in the largest way that a school can get a sense for your personality and who you are um because it's something that it, it adds so much more color to the profile and a quick little rule of thumb that i like to tell my students is like a test to see if it's a good essay is let's say your essay let's say you printed it out you know people who still print things right and it was sitting in the cafeteria and it didn't have your name on it right your essay is just sitting there and if somebody were to pick up that essay and read it would they know it was you who wrote it? I think that's a really good test to see if it's really showing your character and personality. So think about that one. Uh, letters of recommendation, those typically come from teachers and counselors and sometimes outside recommenders like coaches, or if you have a boss, you did an internship or you did research with a professor, some schools will accept those outside letters as well. And the letters also are meant to show off Again, your character, your personality, who you are academically, how curious you are, how, how you behave in the classroom, are you respectful, are you a good team player, and all those things. And a, a good letter of recommendation can go a long way. And I, I don't often hear of bad letters of recommendation, meaning like teachers writing bad things about students, usually, at least I would hope if, if a teacher can't write a good recommendation letter, they just won't do it for the student. But a neutral letter of recommendation doesn't really help a student either because um, it's not it's not necessarily adding anything to their profile. So it's really important for students, especially students who are in their junior year right now, which I know is a bunch of you here, to really develop those relationships with your teachers and to really show your best self in the classroom, show up on time, put hard work into everything. If you have any questions, make sure you're communicating with your teacher and really put your best foot forward because these teachers might be writing your rec letters next year. The admissions interview, usually the more selective schools will do an interview. The less selective schools, the interviews are kind of falling out of favor and that's just more of a time thing. There's just so many students to get through. Um, some schools do interviews before you apply. A lot of them do them after you apply. That's also very dependent on the school. But speaking skills are so important. And the interview is another way that a school can try to capture your personality, what you would be like on campus. You know, are you are you likable? Are you fun to talk to? Right. And I think also it's it, it it's like a test almost to see is the rest of your profile accurate. And an interviewer doesn't like see your application. They're not usually gonna read your essays. Usually it's an alumnus of the university that will sit down with a student either at a coffee shop or mostly over Zoom these days. And they'll write up a couple paragraphs and send it to the, the admissions profile. So it's, it's a way to fact check in a way. Like let's say a student talks about in one of their essays, a research project that they did, right? I would assume if this student, you know, if this was a legit interest of theirs and not just something they were putting in to fluff up their resume, that they would talk about it in this interview and they would talk about it passionately, right? Uh, probably the worst thing a student can do is to 
sort of claim they're passionate about something and then not have anything to back it up. Like I've, I've heard an anecdote from an admissions officer once about a kid who went on and on on his essays about how passionate he was about the saxophone. I mean, he played it in bands, like it was so cool. And then in the interview, he was asked, oh, like, who's your favorite saxophone player? And the kid froze. <laughs> so how can you really be passionate about something if you aren't actually really dug into that community. So so it is a, a way to kind of fact check. Um, and then it, it's also important to show your communication skills, right? Can you talk to an adult, but also can you show up on time? Are you going to show up you know, respectful? You don't have to wear a suit and tie, but definitely not in your pajamas, right? So how do you approach adults? Demonstrated interest. So I talked about that a little bit in the beginning that factors into does a college really know that you're committed to them. And that could be as simple as talking to admissions officers, visiting campus, following on social media, signing up for their newsletters. Um, the biggest way to demonstrate interest would be to apply early decision, which is a binding deadline. So when you apply early decision, you're telling a school that if I get in, I will go. That's the highest form of demonstrating interest you can do. But there are some caveats to those decisions. And again, that's that's another topic, um, but that's one way to do it. And then the last couple of factors are the two that are mostly out of control of the students, you know, socioeconomic situation. That's just, that just is what it is. And that really goes more into what are the institutional priorities of a college? Are they looking for more kids from the East Coast, from the West Coast, from the South, from this particular demographic, from that particular income level? VIP status, again, that's kind of hard to do unless you're like a celebrity and that usually refers to the whole you know legacy or children of donors although there's a lot of talk about that kind of falling out of favor too i know with the recent supreme court case there there wasn't legacy wasn't necessarily involved in that case but there's more chatter about it and some schools are pulling legacy as a factor um but being a recruited athlete is also a really good way to get some VIP points because if you're really talented and you're getting recruited, that can sort of tip the scale in your favor a little bit. But if we're looking at schools, you know, Ivy Plus, your Harvard, your Yales, your Princeton's, you could be the best football player in the world, but you still need to meet an academic standard to get into those schools. So it's not going to balance out if the rest of your profile has not much else to it. So that's the overview of all of the factors that are considered and and a very quick overview. But if you'd like to talk about it more, please reach out and, and I'd love to give you guys some more details. But moving on on this topic. So we have three main questions here. And this is what the admissions officers are thinking about. So when an application gets plopped in front of them and they're reading through holistically their whole profile, they're looking at their transcripts, their essays, their activities lists. They're thinking to themselves these questions, right? Can they be successful academically? Will they do meaningful things with their life? And are they authentic? And we'll get into what that means in a little bit. But this is what really is the, the, the crux of the argument here. If you can answer yes to each of these questions, and like a resounding all capital yes, right? Then your chances of admission at a selective school are gonna be much higher than if you don't have a yes to all three of these. So we'll go through what each of these questions means in a little bit more detail. So the first one, right, what you do in the classroom. So that is the numbers and what we were talking about. So your rigor, your, your GPA, your test scores. So that's kind of straightforward. If you have good grades, then it shows that you can succeed academically. And if you have good grades in really hard college level AP, IB, dual enrollment classes, then it shows you can do college level classes. That one's a pretty cut and dry question. So let's see, can you thrive academically? So, so at different schools as well, we're talking about more selective schools here, right? So obviously they're going to be more academically rigorous schools. So, and and that's why we think this is just a small piece of this, right? So yes, you need to be above this sort of minimum threshold to be considered, right? Like if you have a 3.2 GPA and a 1300 SAT, 
you'll get into a college. It'll be hard to get into a highly, highly selective college. And that's just kind of what it is at the end of the day. So if you are a student who's not super rigorous academically, you know, not super high GPA, not super high test scores, I'm not saying don't apply. Uh, you know, I never tell my students don't apply anywhere, like, but you want to be realistic when it comes to balancing out your college list in the end and make sure that you have a nice, well-rounded list. Because I've seen students who apply to only highly selective schools and then they don't get in anywhere. And so it's really important to, to kind of play that, that field a little bit. And that's something that we work on with all of our students is making sure that it's a balanced list. So really, once you get past that academic threshold, let's 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 say you're there, right? Let's say you you got that 3.87 and you're at a 1520. It's like you've met the minimum, right? It's really the second two questions is where the decisions are going to be made. So that's again back to the personal traits, the character traits, everything outside of the classroom. So lots of your extracurriculars and, and your communication skills as they show through your essays, your interview, et cetera. So the second question, is a student going to do meaningful things with their life? So one reason a college asks this is, of course, they want students on campus who are going to do meaningful things on campus, right, who are going to be positive contributors to the community, but also after they graduate. Part of it's a slightly selfish motivation of the college, right, because they want to say, hey, check out this cool alumnus who invented this wild thing and they're super successful. Go them. They went to our school. Like, there's a little bit of college ego involved there, right? But colleges are also, they're invested in the future, right? They put a lot of time and effort into innovation and they want to mold students into people who are going to go out and, and really make changes in the world. And if you think about any large tier one research university, like they are on the cutting edge of every single field from literature to medicine, right? So they're out there making a difference, creating new knowledge, and they want students who want to contribute to that in the end. So how do you show that while you're in high school? And that goes back to what you're doing. It's going to be quality over quantity, right? So a lot of students will say, hey, do, do I have enough activities? Like I only have five activities on my activities list. And, and I ask them, well, how much have you dug into that activity? Is it just, you know, the, the fiber arts club where you're knitting hats for an hour once a week? Or is it your, you know, pet project that you're spending, you know, 15 hours a week coding an app to help a healthcare company, right? And uh, these, these are all real examples of things my students do, right? But, you know, which one shows a lot more depth and substance, right? The kid who's interested in computer science and actually spending hours and hours and hours doing something with a real, actual real world impact, or the kid who's just doing stuff for fun, right? So... It's so really about how you approach the things you do, right? Approaching things from what kind of difference do you want to make in the world? Who do you want to make an impact on? What kind of positive impact? And some students also think that, you know, the impact they make has to be large and grand. They have to cure cancer. They have to solve climate change. They have to make it to Mars, but it can be small things as well. Uh, especially artists really struggle with this question, like, you know, who am I really making an impact on? I'm an artist, I'm just creating art. But, you know, can you use art as a medium to send a message or for a cause? Like, I have a student right now who is an artist, very talented artist, but she wants to study business. And what she's done is she's taken her art and printed it on T-shirts, and she's selling those T-shirts, and she's using the proceeds from the profits from those sales and donating it to a charity of her choice that relates to the design of the art on those t-shirts. So it's a way that she's taking something she's passionate about and tying it into her intellectual interests and turning it into something meaningful that's actually having an impact. And she's talking about it in all of her essays and she's putting together a portfolio of pictures of these things for the colleges that will accept the, the portfolios. Um, so really it's how, how much are you digging in to what it is that you're doing? Are you just scratching the surface level? Are you just showing up? 
Or are you thinking to yourself, how can I go beyond? How can I put more effort into this? How can I make a larger, more meaningful impact on somebody else through this activity? And this you're going to show through your essays, your resume, your letters of recommendation, your teachers, your counselor can talk about the impact that you've had, right? How much thought are you putting into all these activities? That's what is really going to make a student stand out. Um, and, and again, there's no one right way to do it. Just some other examples off the top of my head. I had a student last year, uh, one really cool thing she did was um, she's Indian and she found that none of her teachers could ever pronounce her name properly. So she created this district wide initiative where all the students would put in the phonetic spelling of their names onto a spreadsheet. And so teachers could learn how to properly pronounce their names. So it's something that seems like pretty simple, but I mean, if you think about it, it's also, it's, it's a sign of respect for somebody to say your name properly, right? So it's just this, this student experienced a problem and she decided that she would come up with a solution and not just for her, but for every student who might be facing the same problem. So again, like thinking about others, how she can do something that, that makes a larger impact. These are all these tiny things that if you build enough of them up together, it's going to prove to a college that there's, that, that this is how you live your life. Um, there's a saying that I tell my students and even my friends, even when they don't want to hear, but the, the way you do one thing is the way you do, you do everything. If you put thought into, you know, how you live your daily life and people will believe that you put thought into what they do. So we'll go through another little case study here now that we've talked about a little bit. Um, you guys can interact in the chat again, right? So let's take a couple of students and let's say they're completely identical in every single way, right? And they're undecided on their college major, which by the way is fine. Like 50% of students apply undecided. It's totally okay to not know what you want to study. You do have to have a larger plan though, but besides that fact, the first student, they have a really cool internship at a research university. They do Alzheimer's research. They're working with the professor. That's what they spend their summer doing. The second student starts an ice cream stand in their neighborhood and is pretty successful over the summer. Which student, and you can vote in the chat, just tell me student one or student two, if you were an admissions officer at Princeton, which student would you want on campus? And maybe tell me why, but at least vote. Okay, we got a 50-50 split right now. We got a one and a two. Anybody gonna break the tie? Probably two because they have more hands-on experience. Yeah, I, I would err on the side of two, right? Because this student showed initiative, right? So, they took an idea and, you know, it's, it's, if any of you have ever run a business, it's not as easy as just like, let me buy some ice cream and sell it. I mean, there's, you got to market yourself, you got to network, like people have to know about you and okay, you got the ice cream, but you have to figure, okay, well, how am I going to keep it cold? And am I going to have different toppings? And, you know, how am I going to make sure that it doesn't, you know, get to give people napkins so they don't make messes and maybe they need a permit to sell ice cream on a street corner. I mean, you know, that's kind of how things are these days, right? And so it's something that they took initiative to do themselves, probably ran into some challenges along the way, shows that initiative, right? Trying to solve a problem. And they're they're a little bit of a hustler, right? They, they want to make some cash and they're putting themselves out there, um, taking a risk. I mean, there is a risk that they bought a bunch of ice cream and maybe nobody shows up that day and I have a bunch of melted ice cream and just going to go, all right, well, let me feed all the sugar ants because nobody else is going to eat this, right? So a little bit of a risk taker there. And I'd say that shows a student with a personality that they're, you know, they're, they're brave, they're proactive, right? The first student, not a bad student, clearly, like intellectual, curious, wants to do some real serious things, but 
if you think about the structure of what they're participating in, right, they're, they're sort of following along somebody else's path. Right. It's not their own original research. This research institute was already established. This professor has already been doing this. And if they're just a high schooler doing an internship, they're probably not, you know, the main one running this research program. They're probably just doing some menial intern labor. It's not it's not that deep. Right. They don't have to do a lot of critical thinking. Uh, maybe maybe. I'll take that back. Maybe they do, depending on what the you know professor wants them to do. Maybe they're doing some background literature reviews, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the main point here is that the first student is sort of latching on to somebody else's initiative, right? Where the second student is creating their own initiative. And that's why I think the second student stands out a lot more, right? It might not be as glamorous to sell ice cream as it is to perform Alzheimer's research, but it says so much more about who that student is and that they're willing to take that risk and, and put themselves out there. So I'll give another example of a student I worked with uh, a number of years ago um, and how she developed her depth and substance over time. Um, so Grace, we started working with her. She, she was interested in healthcare. She was thinking about med school. Um, she just, you know, liked biology and health and she was just kind of wondering, okay, what, what activities should she do to kind of help prepare for that? So I suggested that, why don't she join her local town's EMS squad? Um, Cause at that point she, I think she just turned 16 or was turning 16, which I think is the minimum age in her town. Um, so she joined the EMS squad and she got a lot of experience with that. I mean, that's, if you're looking for med school, I think that's, that's great. It's not only is it volunteering, but you're getting actual medical training and you're sort of seeing like, this is what it's like. Right. Um, but it wasn't just that, that I think made her into a unique student. It was some of the experiences that she had um, in particular, there's one repeat customer, as they call him. It was an elderly gentleman, and I forget exactly what his health condition was, but he was a, a frequent flyer. And he was also hard of hearing. He only spoke sign language. And she didn't know sign language, but she kept running into this guy in her line of work, and she couldn't communicate with him. So she learned sign language. And then she realized, wow, nobody really knows sign language. This is this is a, a whole portion of the population with a, this, you know, hearing disability that they're kind of being ignored. Like we should we should do something about that. So not only did she teach herself sign language, she started a sign language club at her school so other people could learn sign language. And then this experience that she had with this individual and and researching the you know the. ADA, like disabilities and just the whole spectrum of issues around it inspired her to kind of change her mind a little bit. And she didn't want to go to med school anymore. She decided that she was more interested in disability rights and public policy and human rights. So this experience really opened her eyes to there's more ways to make an impact than just the sort of stereotypical ideas that you know a young student might come up with because they don't they don't really know any better right like you want to be a doctor and then that's the you know it's this idea but you don't have the experience to know exactly what that's like and that's so much of what I try to do with my students is really push them to have new experiences so they can start to think a lot more in depth about what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they can make an impact and um, she ended up at Barnard, which, if you don't know, is the, the sister college to Columbia University in New York. So I think, you know, Grace is a great example of somebody who wasn't quite sure going in, but she was open minded and willing to put in the effort to make an impact. And it ended up changing her old trajectory for the better. So question three, are you authentic? So this is also kind of the crux of the matter here, right? Like we got grades and test scores and we have your extracurriculars and it seems pretty straightforward how you display those sort of things. You know, what you're doing is if it's meaningful now, then it could be meaningful later, but how, how on earth does a student display authenticity, right? How do they show that they have this genuine desire to do things? And, and you do have to demonstrate in your essays and in your interviews, but it's really more about like, where do your motivations come from? Do they come from an 
innate curiosity and just a, a desire just to do better, you know, just to level your own skills up, right? Or does it come from a place of wanting to be better than other people, right? Kind of wanting to show off. Um, and colleges can kind of pick up on that. They can pick up when a student really, you know, has this genuine interest in what they're doing because it comes out in the profile. Um, I'll go back to my whale watching pig. I think he's a great example of this is, you know, he's super passionate about the environment and he's not really in any clubs at his school actually, but he does like a lot of his own things besides the whale watching. He goes like backpacking and hiking and he does a lot of bird watching and wildlife photography. And like, that's just like his personality is he's, he's the outdoors man, you know, and he's writing his essays about it. And it also, matches up he wants to study wildlife conservation right so that all checks out so this is authentic because a lot of the things that he's done really ties into what he's saying he wants to do right so students who are inauthentic or at least might come across as inauthentic might be the ones where their profiles are kind of all over the place they just only have surface level uh, interaction with, you know, maybe a variety of different clubs. And when they're writing their essays, and let's say it's a, you know, why do you want to study this topic? It's just like, oh, you know, I, I want to be an engineer, because I think, you know, Legos was really cool. And I like working with my hands. You know, like, it, this, it's not really an answer that has much oomph to it, it hasn't had much thought put into it. Um, another way that a student can show they're authentic and especially in the interviews something that comes out is like you, you've all met the kind of person who just when they start talking about the thing they're interested in you like you can't stop them they're just going they're going they're going they're going I mean I, I'm like that like if you get me on certain topics right um and that that's authenticity there right it's it's it just comes out and they don't even have to think about it right so if you don't have that passion that really gets you going, right? And makes other people be like, gosh, like, well, they stopped talking about that already, right? If you don't have that, then how do you find it? You gotta explore. You gotta get out of your comfort zone a little bit. You gotta try new things, join new clubs, you know, ask around your, your friends, your family friends, who's got a really cool job. Could you shadow it at some point, right? It, you really have to, get out of where you are, get out of the box that you're in and see new things. Um, and it doesn't have to be crazy. You don't have to go on a globe trotting trip, right? You can do things in your own town. Um, I know somebody who's, uh, she's actually a, a, an older woman, but she learned about, uh, at least in Annapolis, we have a big problem with invasive ivy. And she learned this was a problem and this just turned into her mission. And I see her all around town and she started on a nonprofit and um, I live across the street from a park. She's always, always in this park. They're all just like cutting down this invasive ivy. It's like her thing, you know? So, and that just like came out of nowhere. I think she like was talking to a landscaper one day and just like in conversation and learned about this and realized it was a problem and then just made it her mission that she's just going to cut down all the ivy that's killing all the trees around town that's it. That's her life's work right now. So you never know like what kind of who you talk to and who you engage in conversation with that, that an idea might pop up. So let's do another little activity here. So a number of years ago, um, Princeton was asked to do this sort of forensic analysis of a, a situation at a school where they had their top three students apply to lots of these highly selective schools and uh, there was a bit of surprising results so let's let's go through this a little bit and and maybe you guys can follow along with me and, and try to to uh, think through this so we have these three students here and they're all pretty much the same in many ways they're all at the same school they're all female they're all immigrants that have english as their second language they're pretty much academically identical um, they had good essays, they had good letters of recommendations. Um, Nada was the most accomplished extracurricularly. She had done some like really cool research, but otherwise they were all pretty comparable. Um, so 
back when they did school rankings, uh, Native was number one. She wanted to do pre-med. Carolyn was two. Nardine was three. They'd applied to all the Ivy League schools. And, and here were the results. So Nardine, number three, was admitted to half the Ivies. Carolyn was admitted to all of the school she applied to, but Nada, the number one, wanted to study pre-med, only got into one school, Rutgers. Does anybody want to take a stab at what might have happened here? I know there's limited information, but just curious if you guys have any ideas based on everything I've said so far. Interview went wrong, possibly. Nada wasn't rounded enough, maybe. Although again, all students don't really need to be rounded. Pointy students are allowed to. Her app wasn't authentic or passionate. So, Authentic was a clue word here. We are in the authentic station here. Carolyn stood out because of her major. That They're a little bit of a, a less popular major, right? A lot of kids do apply to pre-med, so that definitely could have been a factor. Um, so what we found out uh, was when we took a look at all of their transcripts. And remember when I, in the beginning, when I was talking about rigor, Right. So academic rigor, you always want to be challenging yourself more and more and more every year. And so all these students were taking pretty rigorous classes. They were all taking AP this, AP that. Um, but what was interesting about Nada was that she took an AP English class her junior year. And there's two AP English. There's Lit and Lang. Right. And then her senior year, she took honors English. Why do we think she dropped down to honors English. She got an A in AP English, so why would she drop down to honors? Any guesses? Too many activities? Maybe. And the thing is, like an admissions officer, all they can do is guess. Right, because they just have your profile. They don't have a chance to call you and ask for clarifications, right? Doing the same thing because AP Lit didn't run in my school. Is that a problem? It's different when it's not actually a choice. That That is a different situation. But she had a choice. She had a choice. So what do we notice about Nada? She's number one in her class. So the assumption that we think the admissions officers made, because again, all they can do is assume, is that she, you know, AP English was hard for her, right? Maybe she got an A minus, I don't remember exactly, but she went down in a level because she might've been afraid that her GPA would have gone down if she took a more challenging class and she would have lost her spot as number one. That's probably the assumption that they made because clearly she's a bright student, right? But she was so worried about being the best that she didn't want to challenge herself. And that is a red flag, right? That goes into the authenticity factor, right? If a student doesn't genuinely want to learn more and really dig in and really Back to, you know, taking some risks, like, okay, maybe you will lose your rank, but you'll be a better writer, reader, analyzing for it. We, we think that the admissions officers probably thought she was so concerned about her rank that she didn't want to challenge herself. And that's not the kind of person they want on campus. Somebody who is only concerned about appearances and not personal growth. So try to take that one to heart, right? If, if, you're making choices just because you think they'll look better for college. It's not necessarily going to be the right choice for you. You have to think about your motivations. Why are you really doing this? Why are you really making this choice? Right now, Corey, the situation you're saying that there's no AP lit offered. I don't think that would be a problem, right? Because you're still choosing to challenge yourself as much as you possibly can. 
And just because there's not an option there, I don't think the admissions officers will hold it against you. Although I only know this little tiny nugget of information, but based on what you're saying, it should be okay. Based on this little bit of information, so. Okay, authenticity, it's a thing. So at the end of the day, right, colleges want to admit you if you can reveal your character, right? While demonstrating your academic potential, while demonstrating your potential beyond the classroom, and while demonstrating a genuine desire to maximize your potential. These are the three key elements. So how do you get there? So we've talked a lot about that along the way, like digging in, getting new experiences, taking risks, being curious, putting yourself out there, right? And it's also about the skills that you have. So deeper critical thinking, how do you become a better critical thinker? I mean, you can study philosophy, that's one way to do it. But again, by exposing yourself to new ideas, to new situations, by trying to make those connections between ideas, then you can think more about the whys and the hows behind how the world works, right? And that also ties into the third one, right? Making important associations as well, right? That you know your your actions have consequences, not just yours, but but everybody's like how, what is the cause and effect going on in the world? And how can you dig into that and use that to make an impact. Self-awareness, again, comes from knowing what you're interested in and reflecting on those interests, those motivations, and also trying to grow along with them. Like, if you find yourself just totally disengaged with whatever activity is, then you have to kind of take a step back and think, well, what are my motivations here? Why am I really doing this? If I don't actually enjoy it, then what are we doing here? I need to find something that I do want to do that I will start ranting about if I get interested in it, right? And then of course, working on your communication and writing skills. So that will show of course through the essays and it will show through the interviews and it'll show through even like the activities list, the way that you describe what you're doing um, is really important. And these are all the skills that I work on with my students throughout the years in order to help them to kind of level up, right? To this next next part of their lives and really think critically about what it is that they want, but also why and what they've learned and, and how they can take those lessons and really run with them. And these are some questions that I like to ask my students um, to reflect on pretty often, because I think thinking about these six questions can lead to this, again, this greater self-awareness. And I also turn this into a writing activity for my students. So I think it's a great journaling activity just to, to help with your writing as well. But right, like what is it that you do and why? And how have you been challenged by this? Or how have you been given some really cool opportunities? And if you're doing something and you haven't been challenged by it, right, what can you do that will challenge you to grow, right? And what have you learned from these opportunities and challenges, how you overcame them, how you take advantage of them, and, and how have you applied these to other areas of your life as well, right? If you were in a situation where you learned how to be a good team player, how are you a good team player in other areas of your life? And these are some really good questions to think about just when it comes to writing your essays as well. They can help you pinpoint what to, what to highlight in those essays. So. Quick question here. I think I think we can get to more of those questions at the end. We're almost there. So just hold on for a minute. So back to our pinwheel here. So we talked mostly about these personal traits, right? So how you're going to show yourself through your activities, through your essays, and of course, by pushing yourself um, in your academics. And do any of you here think that you can, and you don't have to say this in the chat, but do you think that each of these questions? And if the answer is not yes to any one of these questions, my challenge for you today is to come up with one way that you can take action towards turning that no into a yes. If you're not succeeding academically, what can you do? Spend extra time with your teacher, use online resources, 
YouTube, Khan Academy, resources are everywhere, right? You have your friend tutor you, what can you do to be more successful? Or is it just, can you take more challenging classes, right? If you don't think that you're doing anything meaningful right now, how can you find meaning? Maybe you should try a new activity. Or if you're not sure what to try, ask your friends, what are they doing? What do they think is fun, right? Be open-minded. And if you don't think you're authentic, that's a big question, right? If you think that you're only making decisions because it'll look good to somebody else, I think you have to do some really deep reflecting there and think about what it, what really are your core values, right? What, who, who is the person you want to be, right? If you, a nice thought experiment to, you know, think about yourself when you're 80 years old, right? Looking back at your life, like, or, or even, even if it's a bit morbid, you know, like, what are people going to say about you and your eulogy? If you don't like what they're going to say, how can you make some changes so that you become more in authentic alignment with your true motivations and desires? So that's my spiel. Um, so I would love to answer some questions here. Um, let's see. So can admissions officers see what class op options you have for all subjects, all schools? So usually um, the school profile will include a list of all courses available at that school. Um, and also like your, your application isn't read in a vacuum. You're often it's read alongside other students from your school. So, and admissions officers are also pretty familiar with the schools. Like they're typically broken up by region. So let's say there's an admissions officer that just handles New Jersey. They're pretty familiar with the schools in New Jersey. They know what classes that are offered at those schools. So they, they will have a bit of an idea of if you're maxing out your potential there. Yeah. Um, I don't have a counselor at my school. Is it possible for me to work with the college admissions officer? Yep, give us a call. Here's our email. Um, cool. So I'd love to answer any other questions, uh, either about what I just talked about or anything else related to college admissions. While we're here, hey, um, Nikki. feel free to type into the chat box. Yes. So one of the questions that came through was how are admissions interviews arranged for international students? over Zoom. <laughs> um, so in, in general, depending on the school, um, a lot of them will have like forms on their website where you just sign up for one or they'll tell you, email this person. Um, some schools you can't sign up for an interview until after you send in your application. So you'll find more information about that either. Um, but, but yeah, they're typically... I, I would imagine they'd be arranged over Zoom unless there is somebody local in your country who is associated with that school who can interview you. Yeah. And if you'd like to get our guide to selective app admissions, Feel free to, to download that there. That is our, our gift to you today. Um, yeah, any other questions or comments or concerns? What's the best time to start working on the application and letters of recommendation? So you don't work on the letters of recommendation yourself, right? But you, the way you behave in your classroom, that's something you're working on all the time, right? being a good student, being respectful, being helpful, being curious, being a participant. That's something you can work on all the time. Um, there are what's called brag sheets that teachers and counselors will often send out sometime toward the end of junior year. And that is an opportunity for you to, it's, it's somewhat of a resume, somewhat of a questionnaire. Every teacher does it a little bit differently, but usually it's questions like, what do you wanna study and why, but also, what was your favorite part about my class? Or, you know, what are what are your extracurricular activities? Or, you know, what was a project you really enjoyed working on? Um, so for the rec letters, filling out a good brag sheet with a lot of details uh, could be key, but that's <clears throat> normally towards the end of your junior year. And then best time to start working on the application. 
Um, so like the application itself, like the actual common app doesn't open until August 1st before your senior year, but that doesn't mean you can't start sooner. Um, I start working on personal statements with my students right after winter break, their junior year. Um, it takes a long time to craft a really, really good personal statement. I have students who are, I've been working on them since February, March, and they're just finishing them now. Um, so soon better, but you can also work on all of the skills that will go into your application process too, right? So the writing, the communication, like speaking skills, right? Leadership skills. So like the application is, is a lot more than just this, this form that you fill out, but it's sort of a, a culmination of everything you've learned over the years and everything you've reflected on. And that was a very long answer to a simple question, but <laughs> hopefully I answered it. Anything else? How far back do colleges look for grades, experiences, and you as a person? So they just look at high school for the most part. Um, if you go to a private school that's like K-12, like your transcript might include previous years, but for the most part, they're, they're just looking at what you do in high school. And the questions are asked in college interviews that allow them to understand a student beyond the essay or application. That's a really good question. Um, a lot of times they, I, I wouldn't say it's like too different than what you can say on an essay, but right, like the essay, you're also like the personal statement, you're, you're limited to kind of one story you can tell, whereas you might have many different stories that you can tell. Um, so the, the, the interview, I, I like to call a little bit of like, a, just like a social tryout sometimes. It's not super formal because they want to get to know you on a personal level. Like it's very conversational. They try to make it friendly. They want to know about your interests, but they also want to know like, okay, like why do you want to study this subject? And that might be an essay question, but they, they kind of want to hear it from you. They want to hear your tone of voice as you talk about what you want to study. And, and back to that authenticity, are you just sort of putting out like a boilerplate kind of statement saying what you think you should say, or are you just like effusing passion about it, right? Um, so they'll they'll want to know essentially, can you and, and your personality back up what is on the application? Um, you know, they might open up with a tell me about you, which is sort of a generic opening question. But the whole point of that is to give you the opportunity to tell them some highlights of what you would like to continue to talk about. So it's it's an interview, but it's, it's really it's a conversation, honestly. Like, it's not that like, OK, answer that question next, next, next. Like, I find that, you know, when my students tell me about interview experiences, that it goes fairly organically. And so there's not like a set of questions that are always asked, but it's more, it's it's often guided by the student and how they're talking about their interests. And that would lead the person interviewing you to ask kind of more follow-up questions about it as well. Um, they'll want to know why you're interested in the school. and But an interview is kind of a two-way street as well. It's a chance for you to interview that person about the school so you can learn more about the school. And I definitely encourage my students to do that too. It's a great opportunity, especially like, let's say you didn't get a chance to visit campus or you don't actually know anybody that went there. The person interviewing you very likely went there so they can give you a little bit of an inside scoop on what it's like there too. So that's kind of a way to demonstrate interest as well as if you ask really good questions about the school. Do colleges not consider financial aid for students who had attended private school. Does not matter what school you went to, colleges consider financial aid if you submit a form applying for financial aid. 
Doesn't matter where you went to school. Thank you. I think it was meant to be scholarship eligibility. Well, so, yeah, well, so no, like mer merit aid, again, it, it's, it has nothing to do with where you went to school um, so much as you as like, you know, your sort of application profile, your obviously grades and test scores factor in, into merit aid, but a little bit of it also is back to like the extracurricular profile, like, like, especially when we get to the, like the holistic admissions, like it's not, it's not cut and dry. They'll give you merit aid if they really, really want you to go there. It doesn't really, it's not necessarily always tied to need-based aid. Um, and that really depends on the school. I mean, some schools are more generous than others. If we're talking about the Ivy Leagues in particular, they've all kind of agreed, like, we don't give merit scholarships. Like, everybody who goes to an Ivy League school is a good student. So they only award need-based aid. So every college kind of has their own take on that. But it doesn't have anything to do with your high school. Keep, keep the questions coming, or if any more pop up in your head later, please reach out to us. We'll be glad to help you. And if you're interested in learning about what we do, we can tell you more about that. But we're just happy to be a resource and a part of the community and teaching students and parents more about the college admissions process, because it can be a little crazy sometimes. And changes quite often. I mean, we saw just with this past year, the new Supreme Court decision about um, using, you know, race and admissions. So many colleges this year changed their essays um, to reflect that. And so who knows what's going to happen? We're just kind of keeping all of us on our toes. Like the new SAT is coming out in the spring. So there's always so many different factors going on that can definitely make decisions a little confusing. So we're definitely happy to be a resource here. Um, do we work with homeschool students? Yeah. Yep, we work with all students. Is it important for an applicant to have a sport or not on theme activity? If you don't want to do a sport, then don't do a sport. If you do want to do a sport, then do a sport, right? It goes back to authenticity. Right. So colleges want well-rounded student bodies. They want to they, they look to accept classes like holistic admissions isn't even just about looking at the student holistically, but looking at the entire, you know, 600 people that are coming in and making sure that whole class is well-rounded. So that's why it's also kind of tricky. And, and I go back to these institutional priorities is like you can be perfect student in every single way and you could be authentic you can answer all these questions a yes you like you can do everything right and you can still be denied and it has nothing to do with you which is why it's important to have a well-rounded and balanced list so yeah thank you glad to come thank you thank you We also recorded this session and we'll email it out to everybody for your reference and those who couldn't make it tonight will also get a copy. So reach out if you need anything. Thank you for coming and spending your evening with us. Is there an age limit that colleges have? Nope. You can go to college at any age. I've heard of people in their 80s getting their degrees. There's no, if you can pay the bill and you can meet the academic qualifications, they will accept you. Somebody will. <laughs> Can't guarantee exactly which school, but you know, it's still got to apply to a bunch. Thanks for coming, Brian.
So a person can apply in 10th, 11th grade. Um, actually, some schools do have early admissions programs for juniors. Um, I guess maybe you meant age limit of being too young. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I've heard of students being like 13 years old going to college. It's more about do you have the academic qualifications to go to a college? So if you're like a super seriously gifted young student and you're 12 years old and you've already like exhausted, you know, all the AP multivariable calculuses there are in the world and you're academically qualified, the college can accept you. Yeah, it's rare because you have to be that qualified, but it happens, yeah. You don't even need a high school diploma. You can just get your GED and apply to college. But if you're looking for a highly selective college, I recommend going the traditional route, unless you have a really, really good reason not to. Um, like. I've heard of athletes, like young athletes who just, they, they don't go to traditional school because they're constantly traveling with their sport and they just, you know, get the, the credits that they need, but they get recruited to play a sport. So there's a lot of different ways to achieve the same path. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll keep hanging out as long as people are here and want to chat. Otherwise, it's been a pleasure. All right, Nikki, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, any other questions that might come up, please feel free to email us at, you know, college at Princeton College Consulting.net or um, my email was in the registration. So there's plenty of ways to get in touch with us, but we're going to let everyone um, get on with their evening. All righty. Actually, I, I, I lied, Nikki. Someone just popped pop, pop, pop <laughs> in a question. What is a good age to start consulting with us? Uh, I think we take students as young as eighth grade, right? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> there's a couple of different ways to look at it. We work with, sometimes there's parents who wanna understand what they should be thinking about, kind of guiding their student. And we have a program called Counselor on Retainer, which is more about offering, um, guidance for parents to be able, for them to be able to guide their students. Um, we don't work with the students directly with, um, at, with that program until they're in second half of eighth grade. But um, yeah, we're available for, for strategic guidance along the way. There we go. It's never too soon, but it is too soon if they wanna work with me, not before eighth grade, but you can, uh, you can pick our brains whenever you'd like. <laughs> Can I start tomorrow? Give us an email. Tomorrow might be a little soon, but you can definitely hop on a call with uh, the office and see what we can set up. Yeah, if you want to message me directly, I'd be more than happy to reach out and we can um, chat about what, what it would look like. All righty. Well, sounds like uh, hopefully I'll be talking to some more of you soon. Great job, Nikki. This was really helpful. Thank you, Kim.
Everybody have a good night. Good night.